So I want to just talk very briefly about a project I've been doing since 2012, which I literally just finished doing in August. So I'm still trying to work through the 10,000 photographs I've taken, which may take about 10,000 years, but we'll see. Um, so what I want to talk about is a site called Kilmainham Jail in Dublin. I'll give you a really quick overview of what it is and why it's important. Um, it's part of a very complicated period in Irish history, um, which actually, it extends back to the 18th century, but the time it's really associated with is called Revolutionary Ireland. We like to kind of tag all these things um, at the minute. Um, uh, whereas the UK is going through a kind of commemorative period with the First World War, we're going through a decade of commemoration. So we've got a whole load of stuff afterwards and a war of independence and a civil war. So whole like 10 years of fun, fun, fun with all these um, lovely things to get through. And next year particularly being the most important one, um, which is the commemorations of the Easter Rising. Um, though if you come from the north like I do, it's the Battle of the Somme. So we've got these kind of parallel national narratives all associated with commemorations from 100 years ago. Um, and so one of the really important sites is Kilmainham Jail. So I'll tell you a little bit about that, but I'm happy to answer any questions if some of it doesn't make sense. Um, so just to give a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about, traditionally a lot of graffiti works and social sciences link graffiti to cr male criminality and issues of social exclusion, um, which can be quite a narrow interpretation if you're looking at graffiti in other contexts, where actually it's not about criminality and it's actually about one of the things I'm looking at is gender, so women who create graffiti. Um, more recent archaeological studies, including Jeff Oliver and Tim Needle's book, um, include, you know, bring this kind of nice archaeological imagination to it, where we're incorporating spatiality, materiality, landscape, and multiple intentions. Where actually some graffiti is official, not unofficial. There's different voices. It's not just about tagging and trying to do something against control. It can also be about power. Um, and so trying to combine a lot of these types of studies, I'm looking at issues around trying to look at graffiti in a context that I'm looking at, which is very specific, um, as a means of identification, but looking at recording methodologies, because I do find sometimes there's a lack of actually articulating how we do this. You know, there's a lot of, here's my graffiti, not how did I record it, how did I select it, how did I decide what was important and not important, which when you've got sites like the first wall I showed you, where you've got layer upon layer upon layer, it's actually quite a big task and you have to really think about it. Um, and trying to bypass this idea there's a common sense about what you know graffiti is and how we decide what we're recording. So my lovely blurry picture of Kilmainham Jail. Um, it's very interesting for a prison archaeologist like myself. I tend to do these sites that have two different forms of prison at the same site, which makes them really interesting but quite complicated to understand. As you can see from this overview, it has two different types of wings, which both date from different periods. So the wing on the left-hand side is the older one, which dates from the 1790s, which is the original foundation of the pr uh, prison. And on the right-hand side is more of a mid-19th century panopticon. So you can see two different kind of ideas about the use of space and use of imprisonment and ideas about what role they can have. Um, but also the survival is different of graffiti across this site. Um, just to give you a little bit of a context, uh, Kilmainham Jail, um, as it opened in the late um, 18th century, it tied in pretty much exactly with the Act of Union with the UK, which also tied in exactly with the kind of rise in political activities to try and move away from being in union with the UK. So a lot of the kind of seminal characters of kind of nationalist movements in Ireland are connected to this site because they were imprisoned in it. It became kind of the de facto political prison, though never officially. Um, so people like Wolf Tone, Robert Emmett, Donovan Arossa, Charles Stuart Parnell, Patrick Pierce, James Conley, Countess Markovich are all associated with this site. The only two nationalist heroes of the period who really aren't associated with it are Daniel O'Connell and Michael Collins, though the museum still includes stuff of theirs for some unknown reason. Um, so pretty much everybody's associated with it and it's become incredibly important during this decade of commemorations as this site that is important to people who you know were trying to to enforce this split between Ireland and the UK, which eventually you know took form after the War of Independence. And um, it also connects to social issues as well, which I find as interesting. It had a heightened role during the famine in the mid 19th century because of the amount of people who committed petty crimes really just to get fed. So it had a tenfold increase in prisoners from the years like around 1845 to 52, 53. 
Um, it was also the main centre for transportation to Australia. Um, and it also held female political prisoners, which were held for the first time in Ireland as a state around the time of the Civil War, which is 1922 to 23. And this is the last period this prison was used. It closed exactly at the end of the Civil War, which is great for archaeologists because you've got this finite kind of date <laughs> whenever it uh, stopped being used. And it was also abandoned, which adds a whole new layer also onto the graffiti. Um, just to give you an idea of the interiors, they're quite different interior spaces. So the East Wing, as I said, it's a large kind of panopticon type style, which also has an impact on the type of graffiti you get because it's much more of an open space. So there's a lot of graffiti around doorways, which you don't find in the other wing because it's more of a confined space. Um, so the kind of graffiti forms are quite different, but also because of the... Um, because of the sensitivities around this site, it was abandoned for a long time, as difficult and dark heritage tends to be, because people didn't know what to do with it. Um, that it wasn't knocked down, probably just because of its associations with the Easter Rising, but not because of what happened after. People were really uncomfortable with the Civil War, particularly being manifest here. Um, and so whenever, it was only um, taken in some kind of active ownership around 1960, and that was by a voluntary group called the Comenum Jail Restoration Society. Um, which held the site until 1986 when the government eventually took over custodianship of it. Up to that period, it was just a lot of volunteers who had to put new roofs on a lot of the, like the roof it's on now has been a replacement, but the roof on the other wing actually had pretty much disappeared by the 1960s. So there's a whole load of infiltration, actually making the graffiti really difficult to figure out the layers because sometimes water is washed top layers off. So you're having an intermingling of different layers at the same time which makes it so much fun to try and figure out what's going on. Um, but also, uh, there was an active policy of the Restoration Society not to talk about the Civil War. They actually kind of wrote about, we'll not talk about anything after about 1921. So they didn't interpret anything, and they actually went around this, the East Wing, which is the one on the left, and chipped off the walls of all but nine cells um, around the entire wing. So we really don't have any idea of what was in those. We have a good idea from looking at the West Wing that they were probably full of graffiti. But um, there's only nine cells with any remnants left. And generally they were left because they were considered not to have that much in them or else they were used as storage rooms, which were locked, so members of the public couldn't get into them. And actually they seemed to have started trying to take the surrounds of the doorways off as well and got about bored about five in, so then they stopped. But they took a couple of individual doors off, which obviously, again, they're not comfortable with whatever graffiti was on those doors. So it's kind of interesting trying to figure out what people are trying to cover and what they're trying to are allowing us to see. <laughs> So this is a wall, this is kind of one of the more covered walls, which is in the cell that Patrick Pierce was supposed to have been held in, in 1916. He was one of the leaders of the Rising. Um, and uh, so his cell become this focal point for people to go into add graffiti from a very early stage. I can actually tell, one of the nice things about spending nine months going around to prison, looking at the walls, is you can kind of start to tell what period some of the graffiti dates from. So you can kind of see a black underhand, um, and I, yeah, the up bus and the IRA at the bottom, that's actually, I can tell, I know who that was who did that because her handwriting's quite distinctive and she put her hand, she wrote her name elsewhere. So it's Annie Fox who was in prison during the Civil War. So it kind of, you know, you can kind of find the layers with that. We generally find that engraved graffiti is later and it's often people who came back to visit the site. Pencil graffiti tends to be earlier. So it's a kind of, it means there's a slightly easier way of, um, <clears throat> being able to distinguish what you're actually looking at and trying to figure out what to record. Uh, but there also is some grave graffiti, which is older too, and you can maybe just about make it out on the left-hand side, beside where there's a, I'm not sure if it's a D or a P, um, there's a little signage which has been deeply engraved, and it says J. Hines in it, and it dates from the War of Independence. Um, so some of it's guesswork and some of it's actually trying to figure out where you've seen other things like it before. But I've also tried to bring in using other materials as well so as not to reify the graffiti and actually to use it as a means of trying to figure out what's going on rather than uh, this is a graffiti recording project. So, so I'll talk about that a little bit later. And one of the issues also, with, as I said, with this site is dereliction. Um, the site was derelict for nearly 40 years and a lot of the um, roofs, particularly in the West Wing, were badly affected. There's actually still a lack of kind of roof over some bits of it. Um, so this kind of transitional time, I think, ties in really well with contemporary archaeology's interest in ruination and actually the period between when something was functional and when we're recording it and not trying to exclude that. So actually, I got quite interested in the markers of ruin, which became things like... Um, 
bird droppings everywhere, like animal scratches all over walls, like, you know, things just, I actually count that as graffiti as well. That's a sign of something that happened to the place. You know, it wasn't, and the issue of intentionality is always difficult when it's not something that's written, when it's something that's, you know, uh, like an indentation in the wall. How much is this an intentional mark? How much is it maybe someone moving furniture? But also, how much is it just telling us something about how the site shoes? So I kind of tried to incorporate as many different layers as possible into the recording. And then just some of the issues with the type of stuff that I was finding. Uh, there is many problems, as I said, with the recording. There's the issues of... Well, decay, as you can see from the image on the top left, there's no plaster on a lot of the external walls, um, the interfacing external walls, just because of the the impact of you know weather and um, a lot a lot of the times the roofs were leaking around that area. But the vast majority of those walls just don't have any plaster left on them, so you've lost. And actually, the ones that do generally have graffiti on them, so you're losing whatever was there originally. But also, uh, this lovely double height room is the only room, it's in the administration area, it is the only room that actually doesn't have any floor whatsoever in it. So I had to be kind of quite inventive to figure out how to get up to actually do the recording up there. So issues of access, you know, can become quite um, important. Um, of the middle image on the top, you know, what do we do about post-creation kind of... Um, well, one, this is kind of two things going on. There's evidence of whitewashing after different periods. So there was whitewashing during the War of Independence frequently, and we actually have record of them setting people in to whitewash the walls. But there's definitely sporadic whitewashing during, after the Civil War, where they're covering over things that are really critical of the pro-treaty government. Things to do with memorials of executed soldiers and um, things to do with the border. So uh, you can kind of just about make them out. And the whitewashing's different. The, the initial whitewashing is quite light and sometimes you can see through it. The later stuff's like porridge, it's really trying to cover whatever it's covering. But then you also have all this, you know, bird debris, which, uh, if, again, lovely access issues, but you can get yourself a lovely chest infection starting too long in those kind of places. Nice confined spaces with a lot of bird shit in them, so um, it became a little bit of an issue of your own health, never mind anything else. And again, looking at these ideas of graffiti, um, the top image on the right-hand side, there's evidence of lots of like little postcards and posters being stuck to walls. There's very little evidence of them actually left, but there's evidence of them being stuck to the wall. There's a lot of framing. Um, and so a very few of them like this survive. We can just about see a little bit of paper. And again, it's not officially graffiti, but it's how the walls are being used and it interacts with graffiti. A lot of the times you'll find graffiti written around them anyway. So again, I recorded evidence of those too. Um, on the bottom right, the question of intentionality. Someone's obviously put finger marks on the walls, but are they doing that to clean their hands? Are they doing that, to, you know, to create some kind of, you know, lasting impact to themselves? You sometimes have to question why people are doing stuff and actually what it is and what it looks like now against what it was before. And then the last um, image on the bottom left. Um, this lovely image of a, a woman drawn on the wall, like you can kind of get distracted by the aesthetic sometimes. You find a really pretty picture, it's like, wow, that's lovely. I'm going to take six pictures of this one, where you kind of sometimes have to make yourself not just concentrate on things that are really attractive and actually, well, where is it? What's it trying to do? Who's it communicating with? Who's What's around it? So I had to constantly kind of step back from just being drawn towards the beautiful portraits, of which there's about over 100 just in the West Wing of different levels of skill. So yeah, just the recording methods. Um, I'm not really going to talk too much about this. Me and Alex were having a chat about this last night. Actually, the, you know, nobody in the, not many people actually in this session are talking a lot about our recording techniques and different technologies being used. Um, I just did a small project with a discovery program where we tried to use 3D scanning methods to be able to look at trying to retrieve and grave graffiti because it could be the it's the most difficult stuff to record whenever you're only using light and camera but I do, you do get quite good at being able to use light and camera after a while to create slight shadows to be able to get stuff and we actually did find doing this that sometimes actually for all the technology the photo wasn't much better than what a camera would have taken by itself so you know we'll have to look at how to refine these technologies and actually working with people who are technicians and you're the researcher properly rather than just you're the person who knows about graffiti, they're the person who knows about the equipment. You know, there was sometimes a bit of a mishmash in what we were trying to do. And actually, a lot of the times, the guy I was working with, Gary, couldn't actually see the graffiti that I was pointing out to him. So I'm like, you see that big thing in the wall? Like, no, no, I can't see it. Just tell me where the outline is. So he was always amazed when things turned up. And I'm like, could you not see that while we were standing there? So it was kind of interesting. Just you realize you get so used to a space that you can see stuff that other people can't see. 
because uh, they are quite dark and grim rooms, as you can probably tell. So I'm just really quickly going to just talk about um, just two rooms that just, again, show these kind of issues about methodologies and about what we're trying to study and how we're trying to study it. And I think this is interesting to start with. This is, a, in theory, the administration area. The two rooms I've outlined in red are called debtors room one and debtors room two, which actually, you know, that's a kind of name given to them. But, you know, we have to be careful about taking on what people's ideas of functions are because the graffiti in these rooms show that they, well, at least one of them was definitely not just used to hold debtors or was not used as an administrative area. Mm -hmm. Debtors room one definitely help a political prisoner of some description. And I'm thinking if they're held apart from everybody else and in this admin area they're probably an elite prisoner so this room had been boarded up for about 30 or 40 years nobody had been into it it was a lovely space to go into um, and there was problems with the decay as well the exterior facing wall was um, had problems with a lot of the plaster coming off and around the as you can see around the um, fireplace there was also problems with decay and then the other walls too but there was quite a lot of graffiti survived um, and they became kind of interesting trying to figure out what was going on with it. This is um, beside the doorway on the right hand side. It's quite a prominent, well lit space. You can see that there's two portraits inside of frames which have been heavily whitewashed over and very specifically whitewashed over. So they literally just dab whitewash <coughs> over the top of where the pencil was rather than trying to cover the entire area. But you can figure out a few things from them. Um, from the tiny bit of details you can see, they're obviously portraits of two men. One has a hat on him, which looks like it's probably a military figure, which I always, we always like to just give names to these things. So Michael Collins on the left, De Valera on the right. So everybody has to be somebody famous, but because they're in frames, they probably were, you know, elite political figures. The one on the right, you can kind of see some of the nose and mouth off, even, you know, without do, and a lot of the times they're having to use flash and then trying to play with it to try and bring out the lines. So they don't look like this on the wall. You can actually see slightly more of this. Um, but you can see the tie as well, because for a while I thought it was a woman, because it's got quite a voluptuous mouth. But actually, wearing a tie, I think it's probably a man. So, and then this lady appeared as well on the same wall, but actually closer to the corner. So it was kind of in darkness. So I'm thinking that she wasn't created to be seen like the other two were. Um, and again, quite partial, but probably someone who's an artist. Like, you know, if you're drawing on a wall, you actually need quite a lot of skill to be able to draw quite well. It's not like drawing on a piece of paper. So, um, and she's got a particular, like there's a lot of portraits in this, in the jail, but some of them are quite generic looking, but this one's quite, looks like a specific person, particularly with the hair and things. Um, and beside it, there seems to be a name. It looks like Eva, and it, I'm trying to think it's Eva Gore Booth, who's Contes Markovic's sister, because they're supposed to have had a psychic link whenever she was in jail. And I could imagine maybe she's a, a late prisoner, she might, the kind of place she would have been held. So when I seen this, where I seen Eva, I nearly had a heart attack, but I can't quite make out the name afterwards. It's very, very partial. And again, even playing with the contrast, it just doesn't come out very well. Um, but one of the other things I find trying to tie into material culture, if you look at the bottom where the arrow is, there's a tiny little um, flower. This happens quite a lot. They draw kind of inside the frames. So this kind of little flower figure. And then when I was looking at the, um, some of the material culture left in the... Um, in the archival collections, if you look at, and again, this is why it's worthwhile going to look at things instead of just seeing photographs. Like this is a rather impressive looking, um, you know, kind of uh, embroidery. When I actually look at it close up, they use the style of the stitching is actually quite interesting because they change the, the direction of it for different pieces. So it's actually quite a nice piece of work. It's called the Volunteer Trampling on the Union Jack, and it was either created by the O'Reilly or the O'Reilly sisters. And it's a copy of an old Fenian image. But whenever you hold it up to the light, these traces of little flowers, like a frame, appear around it as well. So it looks exactly the same as the type of flower that appeared on the wall in the graffiti. So there's a kind of amount of replication across these different forms of a, you know, a little motif. So it was kind of interesting just to find that. And again, not if I hadn't have literally been starting holding it up to the light, I wouldn't have noticed it. And so very just quickly, the room with no floor, which was enticing me for so long, I eventually got OPW, the custodians of the site, to get me scaffolding so that I could get up. So we knew the floor had probably disappeared before the 60s, so <coughs> there'd probably been no access for quite a long time. We're very excited in case there was lots of graffiti in it, because it was next to the room with all the interest in graffiti. Of course, that never happened. So <laughs> it became a kind of interesting exercise in trying to figure <coughs> out what is actually important in the walls. The only piece of prisoner graffiti turned up was this, 
which is very hard to see because it's been whitewashed over, but it, um, you can just about make out at the top right corner, it says arrested 14722, which is during the Civil War. Dennis Rooney, and he comes from somewhere in County Sligo, and there's a line at the bottom which I couldn't quite make out. Um, there's also other bits and pieces like this. You find, uh, you know, these really, really partial. Sorry, I'll, one minute and yeah. I'll totally finish. There's one, um, there's lots of really tiny partial bits and pieces that come from under layers. And sometimes you're like, is that a builder's mark? Is that something that's being drawn? And, you know, trying to question what exactly you're looking at. To extremely partial, where you're maybe getting tiny bits of pencil underneath, or maybe it's just the line of where the, you know, the plaster's being broken. I just sort of end up taking pictures to have a look to say, well, what does this look like when you photograph it? And actually some things when you photograph look more like graffiti than they did on the wall. And you have to be careful you're not creating stuff that's not there including this, this kind of long black line. I was like, mm, I'm not sure if that's something or nothing, but it kind of looks a little bit like the Comnemon shotgun. And I'm like, probably isn't, but it does have the same, you know, kind of vague structure. So again, you're having to look at what exactly was there before the, you know, the roof came in and nothing really exists as it was whenever it was closed. And then, you know, finding this little phrase again shows you this site, this room was probably used as some kind of higher end admin area. You know, they're not putting phrases around prisoner cells. So, so I'm just going to, I'm not even going to do any concluding thoughts. We can talk about it later, but just again, about just asking about looking at graffiti, looking at what we're doing the studies for, looking at how it interacts with other material forms. And, you know, maybe trying to pull together what the intentions are and how are we using graffiti to understand space and experience of it rather than just recording you know, attractive pictures. So thank you.